Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar organized by School Education Gateway. My name is Marta and I'm pleased to host this event today. Just a practical information for the audience, uh, the webinar is recorded and the recording might be used for dissemination purposes. If you have questions, please post them in the chat and we will have a Q&A session in the end. Today's focus is new online reading skills, how schools can tackle information disorder. Uh, this webinar presents you the latest research in the field and gives you practical examples of new reading skills curriculum projects. The second part of the webinar provides you with workshops, ideas and how teachers can deal with information disorder in the classroom context. I am very happy to present you Kari Kivinen. He is currently an education outreach expert at the European Union Intellectual Property Office. He has over 30 years of experience in international education and Kari is a member of the informal commission expert group on tackling disinformation and promoting digital literacy through education and training that was constituted in September 2021. But without further delay, Kari, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here today. So, hello everybody. I will share first my presentation with all of you. So here we go. Um, I will be speaking about 45 minutes, um, but don't get bored. Um, the assistants will put uh, information in chat, the links about what is going to be said, and so you can save them for food. You can check them after this presentation. So, like it was told, I'm working at this moment in EWIPO, in Alicante. I'm leading an IP in education project. Our mission is to promote creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship and responsible digital engagement of young Europeans. We have a lot of materials in all the European languages, which you can find from Ideas Powered at School. You can Google it and, and find it. But um, for the last four or five years, I've been working together with Finnish fact-checking organization Faktabari, where we have developed this educational approach, uh, adapting fact-checking um, methods for school environments, for teachers and for students. And if you're interested to read more, you can maybe upload some of the uh, documents or, and guides we have made. For example, this elections approach, are you ready? fact-checking for educators and future voters. At present, uh, Faktabari is working together with the um, European School Net with a very interesting Facts for All project. And we are developing a MOOC uh, for school communities to tackle this information together with students, teachers and parents uh, working together, creating a policy for the schools. So you can maybe follow that one too. I will start with the kind of definitions. Um, normally, we are speaking about media and information literacy. But if we are interested more in fact-checking and uh, information, um, this is concentrating on information literacy, part of MIL. And because we are going to speak about digital uh, information literacy, we are going to through the online uh, information uh, complications. So the definition of digital information literacy is a set of skills which everybody needs to discover, access, analyze, create, store and share information in the digital environment. One needs critical thinking skills in order to make balanced judgments because there are a lot of information and we have to always analyze whether the, info, the materials we are uh, finding are matching our information needs, if they are accurate or if they can be shared. Um, information literacy is a cornerstone of democracy because it, it empowers us as citizens to read and express informed views and to engage fully with the society. Information disorder uh, is a combination of different types of wrong information. 
Um, the first one, which is the maybe the, the everybody knows it, misinformation. It's a mistake. We all make mistakes. Teachers, when they are explaining something to the class, make mistakes. Journalists, when they are writing something, they make mistakes. And also the politicians make mistakes. The misinformation is something which is um, wrong information, which is shared without no harm or bad intentions. And often, for example, quality uh, um, uh, journals and media is correcting their mistakes. This information, on the contrary, is a false information which is shared knowing that it's false. And often there are different types of uh, motivations which are um, sometimes quite harmful or they are um, economical or political or whatsoever. Um, false content is shared more and more often in the online environments and we have to be alerted for that. Um, malinformation is probably um, correct information but it's shared against the wish of the person or the organization. For example, leaks, hate speech, harassment, um, gossips, um, something um, we are speaking behind somebody's back, uh, trying to give bad image of this person. All these are called information disorder. In many contexts, people speak only misinformation or disinformation, but this is what is already meant, and often meant the whole bunch of information. Now, in a good old times, about 20 years ago, when we wanted to know something, we could do, take encyclopedia. And here is the Finnish encyclopedia, Rokotus means vaccine. We could find in the alphabetical order information about everything. Uh, it was made by a um, journalist or scientist. It was normally quite reliable. We could um, kind of be sure that the information there is correct. Now we have these wonderful search engines. Um, and for example, on Saturday, I made a Google search on vaccine. I got 1,240 1, million hits. The point is that we as online users, it's left to us to decide which of this information is correct, which of this information matches our need, and how to pick the right information in the flow of information of uh, such huge. The problem is also, and the tricky thing is, that the Google search or any other search engine searches are not the um, same for everyone. The algorithms are giving us results which are kind of modified based on our um, own use, our interest, our past uh, use of this search engine. And they are different to everybody. And even more serious is that one can buy uh, the good access or good place for one's content in the um, platforms. So uh, very often the top 10 uh, information are uh, promotional, commercial, or they are kind of uh, sponsored contents. And we as users, we have to decide what to, what to believe and what to not to believe. It's the same comparison with the library and social media. Um, if you go to any library in the world, uh, you ask librarian about anything, they can find you a book because uh, the library the books in the libraries are well organized. They are having index, they are classified, and you can find, if you're looking for mammals and camels, you can go to the zoological department, you can find the book, and you can uh, be sure that it's printed, it's quite reliable information. If you use social media platforms, you get whatsoever. For example, I did this last uh, Saturday, and for some reason, my YouTube is giving me uh, top uh, hits are linked to the British uh, progressive rock band called Kamen. Never heard about them, but somehow it tops my, my list. What I want to say with this is that um, in spite of the fact that the search engines, the social media is full of information, we as citizens, we as information users, we are having the big responsibility 
to decide ourselves which information can be used. Online environments and the platforms are made um, by commercial organizations to maximize the commercial interest. They are made to capture and sustain our attention. Uh, they are collecting data of us and they are selling it for advertisers. And what is the maybe the most scary thing is that they are kind of developing models that they can predict and influence our, our future. If I want to buy a car, I start to get car uh, advertisement. If I want to do something else, they are kind of learning quite quickly what I'm looking for. And if it's if it's still commercial, it's OK. But if it's political or if it's uh, linked to the faith or something like that, it starts to be doubtful. Um, there is a interesting uh, research done by Kosureva uh, et al. They have uh, published the citizen versus internet, where they are kind of creating um, a, a theoretical framework on online environments. They are proposing um, four entry points. What can be done uh, in order to ensure that we citizens, we are receiving correct information. First of all, uh, there can be law and ethics. I mean, regulations, ethical guidelines. It's very difficult. Uh, for example, in EU to regulate uh, the big platforms. The technology can be also used for something uh, good and something positive. And, and uh, algorithms can be created to, to do um, um, something which is useful for citizens. Also, the psychological social sciences have to study much more how we are behaving in the online environment what are kind of new type of rules or instructions online users need in order to survive in the information uh, in, in, in infection? And then the last thing, what I'm going to speak today, it's education, um, digital literacy in school curricula. There are some countries, uh, for example, my country, Finland, which has been taking this seriously. At this moment, we are ranking the, the we are in the top of the ranking of media literacy index. At least in this study, in some other studies, we are not so top. But Finnish Ministry of Education has taken this very seriously. And if you want to read more, you can have links to the Finnish media education um, approach. We have a thing called multiliteracy, which is media and information literacy. And it's a transversal competence with um, all the teachers from uh, primary to secondary have to take account whatever is your subject. And the curricula is really well made so that um, multiliteracy is brought to the everyday life of the school. But in spite of the fact that the curricula was developed um, four, five years ago, there is a now a new uh, draft um, um, approach to update, especially the information management uh, part. And it starts from pre-primary education, goes to early education, and then the primary and secondary. And here are some examples. And this is a draft for from uh, Finnish National Board of Education that already in the, um, the early education, children are kind of getting used to use browsers uh, where they can find images and sounds. And systematically, year by year, it's kind of developed further so that the students will learn during the school time uh, how to cope in the online environment, how to um, manage the information in different things. This is not yet in force, but it will be put in force um, in the near future. And I would say that this type of approach is needed for all the member states or, or anybody, all the school systems, that we are learning from early age to use um, online environment correctly. We have noticed in the fact about it that teachers need upskilling and professional development. So we have um, created plenty of materials, um, which um, mainly are in Finnish. But like I said earlier, 
something is um, already in English. Um, these in-service trainings, um, it's not one shot thing because the media, media landscape is reshaping constantly and it has become more and more difficult to distinguish information from disinformation. So there has to be this kind of continuous updating of our skills um, as teachers and maybe this lecture is one of them. We have noticed that there are these elements which are kind of important um, for teachers toolkit. The first to understand the difference between online and offline environments. I mean, I will speak about that soon. And to understand that the social media scenes of students and teachers are quite different. We look information from different sources. We get information from different sources. We teachers tend to get it uh, from, um, let's say, television news, morning papers, um, from official um, information which is prepared by journalists, while more and more youngsters get their information directly through social media, from YouTube, uh, Instagram, TikTok, whatsoever. The development of critical think skills, thinking skills are at the score. I will come back to that. Interaction with the experts is recommended. Um, science concept should be clarified. Which are the experts and sources which are reliable? We are very often speaking only about don't trust in anything. We have to also give reliable information um, for our students. Um, useful checklists, helping the critical thinking, how to deal with uh, confusing contents, how to be algorithm aware, how, how to, how to spare, uh, share it with students, how to check the authenticity of the photos and videos, and how to take care of your privacy. Shortly, um, social media is important part of everyday life of every youngster nowadays. Um, in this study, which was made two years ago in Finland, over 6,000 students took part of it. Um, social media has brought friends, peer support, feeling of togetherness for, let's say, 70% of them. Information on interesting subject, 94%. The way to spend time, 95%. Problems and sorrow, half. But happiness, 93 it's it's so uh, essential that uh, for youngsters that if we as teachers are closing our eyes for social media, we are kind of keeping our lessons without um, having context with that. We are kind of closing our life uh, uh, our our youngsters out of uh, what we are teaching. Um, in Finland, um, this was made before the COVID. Um, the youngsters used about 15 to 20 hours weekly um, in the internet. They were using, um, depending on their age, different types of platforms, but it was everyday use for many. But in states, the situation is already quite uh, more advanced, and this is unfortunately the way we are going for. Um, so the 8 to the 12 year olds are spending um, over four hours per day in the screen. And the teenagers are over seven hours. They are having more time with the online environment than with the school. It's quite important to know. We often think that uh, students are digi native, that they can do everything. And they are very skillful in many areas. They are wonderfully skillful on using different type of apps, being in contact with others, etc. But the problem is on the online reasoning and information management area. The Stanford University has been making these studies um, since 2015. And this is from 2016, but there is a new study which was published only this summer, which shows that um, most students cannot 
uh, make the difference between advertisement from real articles. Um, most high school students uh, take granted the photos without veri verifying them. And uh, they have difficulties to, to, to differentiate between fake sources. And it's quite, um, um, especially the new results from uh, this year are showing that there has not been much improvement. The situation stays the same. So we have to help our students by giving them um, disinformation awareness and online reasoning skills. And the best thing is to do is to promote uh, critical thinking skills. Um, and when we are speaking about critical thinking, it's, it doesn't mean flat out negative about everything. It's more or less uh, carefully balanced analytical thinking um, on the contents we are facing. Um, we have noticed that different type of uh, checklists are helping the critical thinking development. Uh, think twice before liking or sharing, or here on the right side, you can see um, this kind of true or not checklist. Who is the author? Uh, can you find the reliable web address? To whom is made for? What does it really say? Why is it made? On what information is based? Is there evidence or references? Are the pictures authentic? Um, we have now noticed that these checklists are too long, and I'm coming to shortened versions soon. European Union is fighting against disinformation in many fronts, and if you want to, to find a good source of think before you share information, um, you will have this link. Um, it, I warmly recommend you to check what kind of information uh, and what kind of hints and ideas are shared. It's in several languages. Now we come to the Stanford University uh, findings. Uh, Weinbrook and McCrew and the other researchers have, um, have proposed that we are developing new strategy, ignoring strategy. Um, in the online environment, advertisers, companies, lobbyists, theorists, conspiracy theorists, hate groups, foreign governments even, try to hijack our online attention. And um, the wisest thing to do is ignore most of the things we find in the, in the social media. It sounds crazy, but the fact is that if I find 1,000 million hits on vaccine, it's impossible for anybody to even think about to go even through the first 10 of 20 of these. And the idea of strategic ignorance is that if you are feeling that this information is not correct, just ignore it and go, go to the information which, is, mm, which matches with your needs better. So we should learn a new thing of ignoring information instead of um, going through every, everything we find. And they have developed this lateral reading skills, which is based on the professional fact checkers way to, to verify the information. And the latest development is that uh, lateral reading skill uh, means to, to be able to answer the three crucial questions. Who is behind the information? What is the evidence? And what do other sources say? So when you are doing an online search, you get a result. Uh, instead of starting reading it from top down, like we normally do in the printed media, uh, we should check the source, the facts, the stats, and the sources before we are spending any time on reading the article. And this is a typical um, kind of um, hit we get. Um, so checking the URL is already often uh, giving information that this is not a domain name I want to trust to. Um, if we don't find the name of the author, uh, or maybe the date is wrong, the image is suspicious, 
it's uh, skipping. I don't go any further on this, but the lateral reading means that um, instead of checking everything you find in the internet, just uh, concentrate on the information which is really worth reading and skip everything else. Rubbish the rubbish. Information experts, which are journalists, media experts, um, they have to deal with this daily. And it's warmly recommended uh, that the journalists, you can invite them to school to tell how they are making their stories, how they are verifying the background information from how many sources, and what are the responsible responsibilities of uh, the journalists. Because in the online environment, we don't have any responsibility. Uh, anybody, anybody can publish whatsoever. So if you have a possibility to invite experts to your classroom, do it. Um, in most of the countries, there are ethical guidelines for journalists. It's good to, to find it out and, and read it because they are in general, most of the countries, primarily responsible for the readers that they are giving correct information. Of course, every journalist, every newspaper, every media has their own um, kind of focus groups, but in the end, they are, they are supposed to provide um, correct information, at least in theory. The science. Um, during the COVID times, the scientists have been in a really difficult situation. People are wishing to get black and white yes or no answers. Are vaccines safe? Uh, are masks useful? And the scientists have to base their answers to the uh, research. And the research results, the evidence they have, is not so easy to explain to the public. And there are always these kind of probabilities and the percentages. And people feel that they are failing. But science is the, the most close to truth we can get. And if a scientist has made a wrong uh, finding, the next scientist will correct it. It's a kind of machine which is correcting itself little by little. Because the scientific theory is not an opinion. It's based on the proven and valid view. And uh, during the last years, we have maybe let science to be a little bit um, aside, and it's un actually something we should go for. That's why the Finnish Academy in Finland has, um, has created a, um, a campaign to promote science. Uh, so for young people, so the sci scientific information is not an opinion. It has been evaluated impartially and accurately. Um, it builds on knowledge. Evidence-based inf information can be criticized. Con constructive discussion is part of the matter. And scientific knowledge is not the ultimate truth. It changes as understanding increases. And what is interesting maybe for you is that the OECD has decided that in PISA 2025, there is a new competence which will be evaluated. It's a research. Uh, evaluate and use scientific information for decision making. So if you want your students to get good points in PISA, you should uh, kind of take this seriously. Science is also used for uh, kind of um, wrong ends. There are a lot of marketing which is kind of based on science, which is not easy to find or it doesn't exist. And I'd give this example of ginger, which is something which is very positive, it's healthy, it's good. But this uh, little advertisement have been in many um, sites. Recent study shows that ginger is 10,000 times stronger than chemotherapy. But there is no link to the, any kind of uh, science study. There is no link to anything. It's just a statement. And yeah. We should be careful of these kind of statements of um, products which are marketed with uh, with the doctor looking person with white uh, uh, uniform. 
this information is often linked to pseudoscience. There are a lot of false experts. This is UNESCO Milklick's warning about false experts. And during the last years, there has been this infodemic flood of information. And unfortunately, there has been also a total overload of wrong information, disinformation. If you have never ever visited the coronavirus facts database, please do it. It contains over 9,000 fact checks in 40 languages in over 70 countries. And there are unbelievable things you can find. And what is the most interesting thing in this database is that they have made kind of graphical um, um, presentations on how a story goes from country to country in the given time. For example, this one, holding your breath for 10 seconds is a good test to check whether you have COVID-19 or not. It has gone through the whole planet uh, little by little from country to country. This is a, a good source to look at when you are looking for disinformation. Also, the Council of Europe has done um, a lot of materials uh, for link to the pandemic, and uh, there is the links you can go and have a look. I'm coming back to fact checking and critical thinking. Um, so, fact checking approach encourages pupils to be careful, check, state, check statements, and spread only verified knowledge. And we have noticed that um, bringing this to the classroom is a good idea. Fact checkers are not only checking the kind of negative things. Um, this is an example of a fact about it. Uh, we did a fact check of Krita's um, statements in one of her speeches. And uh, we asked two independent experts to verify the information. And we gave a, a stated statement accurate. Greta was speaking on the language of science. Her information was based on something at that speech, uh, which was correct. But the, the, the social media is full of crazy claims. There is a greater chance of dying by being hit by the bus than COVID-19. Think about it. What would you guess? The North Island fact check uh, did check this. And they found out that in Great Britain, uh, it is 3,000 times greater chance of dying from COVID-19 than by, by hitting a bus. So it was totally wrong information. So if you want to bring fact-checking to the school, uh, you can divide the pupils into groups, select claims, ask them to select claims they want to check, and uh, examine it by using different sources, at least two or three sources. And then ask them to write a report and present it to the uh, other class, to the class, uh, with the true, false or 50-50. Because there are a lot of um, disinformation, which is partly correct, but little by little, the conclusions are going far um, much more to the disinformation side. And there are areas where you cannot really say anything else that partly true, partly not true. Also, the opinions cannot be uh, fact-checked because they are opinions. The second idea is to, uh, to create in the classroom different campaigns. For example, vegan food for the school canteen or be nice to animals, whatever. Uh, ask students to create a, a support group to something, create a name to the group, and develop three statements to support their campaign. And one of them should be mis- or disinformation. And when they are pitching it to the other class, uh, other pupils, um, the other ones should uh, find out which of the three is not correct. I've done it several times with different type of publics, and First of all, it's difficult to lie. The students feel that it's uncomfortable to lie and to create this information. And secondly, it's very difficult um, for the other ones to find out which one is not the correct one. It's kind of good exercise. B 
besides of mis, dis, and malinformation, there are a lot of confusing information. Conspiracy theories have been going around, especially during the COVID. I've already spoken about the pseudoscience, clickbait uh, titles, um, sponsored contents, echo jumpers, satire, and irony. Uh, and the European Audiovisual Institute uh, has made a very nice infogram, which is already translated to most of the languages, uh, where you can um, kind of get the basics of different types of um, misleading news. So the workshop idea here is to ask students to choose one of these um, areas, find information about it, some examples, and share with the other ones. Uh, it's co quite um, interesting what they come with. Easy to find. Algorithm awareness. I've already spoken about it. Um, they are wonderful things. I give a positive example. I'm a Spotify user. And every week my Spotify is uh, finding me a, a list of new songs I've never heard of before, which are perfectly matching my taste. I would have never ever found them without the help of the algorithm. So the algorithm has learned to know what, what I like, what kind of music I like, and it's able to produce me a list of similar type of things. Let's see, I like too. The problem is that uh, these algorithms are working also um, in the negative areas. I give an example. Um, I was leading a school uh, two years ago, one and a half years ago in Helsinki, and our um, um, advertisement agency took contact with us and proposed us to take everything out of our YouTube because they had noticed that the YouTube um, uh, users who are looking for pictures for children, especially in swimming, swimming suits, are targeting to the school's um, websites. So the YouTube, whatever you are, or any kind of algorithm, if you are interested in, uh, in, in stamps, you are starting to get information about stamps. If you are interested in um, strange political theories, this is what you get. If you are interested in whatsoever, and it goes also to the negative side. And it creates kind of um, uh, silos which are dangerous. But yeah, so if we are aware of these algorithms, we can use them for positive and then to be kind of uh, careful with uh, other areas. So in the, the last sentence here, the artificial intelligence has nowadays the power to choose the information which is placed, uh, displayed to each individual, and it influences the worldwide uh, and the public opinion, and it's a bit scary. I don't go because of lack of time to much, but I'm just explaining this. When you are into YouTube, um, every second, every minute, every hour, there are millions of um, new videos uploaded to YouTube. There is an algorithm which is classifying these videos, the content, the length, the, the whatever, and it's making a kind of classification. Or we as users, we are classified too what kind of things we have done, what kind of history we have, what kind of searches were made, what kind of um, uh, video clips we are watching. And then the algorithms are putting together out of millions, millions of uh, millions of clips, a ranking list for us, which they estimate that is interesting for us. And if you are watching YouTube videos, and if, if you are not if the one video is ending and the new video is starting, um, if you are not quick enough, you notice that the next video is maybe interesting too. So these algorithms are working really well. And it's, it's positive, but it's also negative. We have to be aware of that. 
there is a nice little exercise. Um, use any uh, any search engine. Ask the pupils to choose any word, the same word, and compare the results. And you will notice that uh, in the classroom, especially the results getting by the teacher and the results getting by the students are very different. So it kind of shows how the algorithms are working in a very personalized way, ways. And it's also a good starting point for discussing the advantages and dangers of algorithms with the pupils. Um, there are also uh, academic search engines, and especially for teachers who are looking for um, kind of serious stuff, uh, good information, I warmly recommend to use, for example, the RIFSEEK or Google Scholar. They are working beautifully and they are bringing uh, kind of uh, research information and, and the articles uh, which are, um, you, you don't have to look so much than in the normal uh, search engines. There are more and more um, problems with the images and videos. Um, the visuals are something we like, and people who want to spread this information or whatsoever, they use strong visuals in order to catch our attention. And very often the picture and the text doesn't match. The picture and the uh, title doesn't match. Or the picture is taken from an other um, situation. And one of the nicest things to do in the classroom is to use um, the reverse image search um, programs. There are Google, Yandex, Bing, uh, Invid has a, a catalog of different type of um, tools. And uh, verify uh, how the photos are used. And there is a quite fun thing. Um, it's uh, advertising the, a little bit adult, but um, Adobe has published a lot of photos where you have to guess if they are photoshopped or not. And it's so difficult. You will, you will like this one. This is an example how photos can be used in a distractive way. Uh, there is a picture of a mess. And um, there was 300,000 Australians um, protesting about inaction in the climate um, policy. And let's say the contraparty um, reposted this photo with the text, look the mess with the climate protesters left behind in our beautiful park. When verified, the photo was not taken on the climate strike, not from the day, it was taken not even the same country. It was from a marihuana based festival, which was held in London much earlier. But the damage was passed, the message was passed, the, the climate activists are leaving a mess behind them. And this is very strong message. And we should kind of verify the images and the texts. And students love to do this type of um, how to lie with the photos. Can you find uh, examples of click bites? Can you find a uh, combination of image and text which is misleading? or to create your own very clicky uh, news uh, in order to catch the other one's uh, attention. And here is an example of a typical strategy. Beautiful girl. Um, supermodels apply these three simple tricks to look young. Click to know what they are. And when you click, you get this kind of blah results. Sleep well, exercise regularly, maintain a positive attitude. But the point is that the site which you clicked has got more visitors and they are paid by the number of visitors and clicks they get and they get money out of this type of way. Before ending, a few words about privacy and digital footprint. Whatever we do, we leave uh, a footprint in the internet. The passive one is left by our, um, our computer IP uh, address. Um, the data scientist can, can follow us uh, quite, clear, quite, quite easily. We, whatever we do, we leave a trace without knowing it. But then we have this active part. And I'm, for example, uh, guilty for this. I have a Facebook 
I'm sharing my lot of photos, lot of information on my basic, uh, my own life. I'm doing it for, for, for free for the platform, and then they use it to to sell the ads. This is a little bit scary. This is very new. It was published a few weeks ago uh, about which, what are the information the companies know about us. And the Facebook is leading it. Instagram is number two. Tinder is number three. And this is how they make their money. They are advertising. Uh, they can focus advertisement based on our, our personal information. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is uh, unbelievable. But I do it because I like Facebook. I like to share pictures with my friends. And yet, I know that it's used against me. There are ways to uh, to manage your privacy settings. Uh, for example, to uh, uh, manage your own online choices. It's quite effective. And you can check your data points from the Google. It's uh, absolutely unbelievable. I would recommend you also to clean cookies from your computer times and times, because they store a lot of information and the cookies are spreading it also to, for the advertisers. One minute. First Draft has a wonderful toolkit for anybody who wants to, um, to have a one site where everything is available. I warmly recommend this. UNESCO has um, um, different types of media and information literacy tools and materials. Um, there is a teaching citizenship journal which have um, which is online available, which have a specific um, number on information disorder, warmly recommended. If you are scared on frauds and scams, there is um, tools like a scam advisor, which can, um, if you are doubting, is this site reliable or not, you can, you can use it. And with the students, this little black boot of, of uh, scams and frauds, uh, it's from Malta, it's, it's quite good uh, to use. And the last thing is that um, last week, uh, the European Commission has published Selfie for Teachers. It's an online tool to assess your skills as a, a user of digital technologies. And it's available in all the European languages. And it's something you can easily um, do in order to get information of what kind of skills you would need to update. Thank you. I'm ready to answer to your questions. Here, yeah. Thank you very much, Kari, for this extensive presentation. Uh, I'm sure all the teachers and the participants found all the materials and resources you presented, and actually we have also here in the chat very useful. Um, I'm not sure if there are questions, but yes, indeed, we invite all the participants to post the question in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I would like to ask you something regarding the campaign you presented to promote the social uh, science during the, um, the pandemic. And I was curious about that, meaning that I would like to know how, how the, the campaign went and if you have any tangible results or concrete outcome that you can share with us, because I think it was a really interesting thing. So the Council of Europe, um created a group of uh, educators to create these materials. And uh, mm, there was a sudden need for online digital materials uh, because most of the schools in Europe uh, moved to the uh, distance teaching. And, and we did uh, in a very short period of time materials which were kind of shared. Unfortunately, I don't have statistics on that. Um, the Council of Europe probably has. Um, but it's um, it's not only the Council of Europe. A lot of um, uh, kind of uh, publishers found the same thing that uh, uh, the last two years more and more information, uh, also the teaching materials, have been moved to the um, online environment, and uh, it's something um, which is kind of it, it came to be stayed. 
I think that there is no way back. A lot of these uh, teaching materials are still uh, on the development. For example, the MOOC we are developing now um, together with the uh, European Schoolnet is, is targeted for the schools to develop their own strategy together with the parents association and together with the students uh, to have a common policy how in our school we tackle disinformation and online problems. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I cannot see the questions though, if there are any, could you please read it to me? Yeah, exactly. The thing is that we don't have questions at the moment. So uh, again, please, I think this is a great opportunity to ask Karin, Kari some questions and I'm sure you, you have um, something to ask. So do not hesitate to post them in the chat. Uh, there were a lot of positive uh, comments in the chat and a lot of thanks. But yeah, I would definitely leave uh more minutes uh, for the participants in case they have questions meanwhile i would like also to remind you that we have a feedback form that will be posted in the chat please do not forget to save the link and you can uh, fill it in after the webinar we have a question uh, relevant information about teacher education and then how can uh, infuse the knowledge I didn't really get the question. Yes, yeah, so I'll try to re-elaborate the question. Uh, I think uh, what uh, Gracinda meant is that you provided uh, re very relevant information uh, for teachers and education, but how can they infuse this knowledge probably to their students? This is what okay. she meant. Okay, so um, Social media is close to every single student in every, ling uh, every subject. And uh, I think the first thing I would do is to show interest. Ask the students, which, where do you find your information? Uh, which sources do you use? And most probably they will uh, not be quite taught of it in the beginning. So, but um, if you are organizing a group work that they are working together and sharing between themselves this information, um, you are starting to find out where, what are the information sources. The second approach could be that, have you been uh, confronted with um, this kind of disinformation recently? And it might be that it's opening the question, uh, discussion in the classroom that, yes, I've seen this, for example, there are a lot of um, boys are interested in football and there are always a lot of disinformation going on which player is sold to which company and or which, uh, which uh, group, etc. Um, the next option could be to kind of do maybe a little uh, uh, a survey in the class uh, on where do you find um, uh, information, what platforms do you use and to share it with the other ones. And little by little, you are kind of getting into the item itself. Um, yeah, and the, the, the workshops I proposed are also a good starting point. One hint still, this uh, database on COVID uh, falsehoods, it's so unbelievably amusing. It, it's so sad, but it's also amusing. There are so strange and crazy uh, claims which have been uh, um, put forward that it's really interesting um, to, to check, ask students to check uh, if there are any um, uh, kind of disinformation they have met in their social media. Many thanks, Kari. Um... Maybe one more thing is that yeah. um, Go tomorrow ahead, please. there is a new working group, expert group on tackling disinformation and, and promoting digital uh, literacy in Europe. Uh, it's organized by the European Commission and uh, we have a very tight uh, schedule. I'm part of that uh, working group expert group. There are 25 uh, experts from different European countries and we are already um, planning to, to create our first recommendations and reports 
uh, in spring 2022. So it's something we are working with. There is also new um, DITSCOMP 2.2 uh, competencies for those ones who are working with the DITSCOMP or EntryComP, uh, which are coming and they are updated uh, very recently with the media and information literacy uh, competencies. So the DITSCOMP 2.2 will be published in, in February uh, 22. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just would like to point out that the presentation and the recording will be shared afterwards. So do, don't worry, you will have uh, everything uh, after the, the webinar. Um, there is one, one question from John. What do you think about the dirty dozen that are claimed to be behind most COVID disinformation? Is it that simple? What do they have to gain by spreading this information? So the, uh, I don't take position on anything which I don't know perfectly well, but uh, often behind the disinformation, there are uh, different type of motivations and the motivations are sometimes difficult to understand. They might be commercial, political, uh, religious, um, uh, ideological. Um, there are all kind of um, groups which are kind of trying to promote the idea, the thinking uh, through social media. And in the past, it was very easy to, to, to find out which is disinformation because it was so badly made. But nowadays, um, there are um, highly sophisticated um, organizations which are providing perfectly beautiful, well-packed, well-presented uh, disinformation for different type of purposes mainly to create confusion, untrust to the politicians, untrust to the governments, untrust to the doctors, untrust against the scientists, um, whatever is the motivation. Um, and once again, if you go to this database of COVID-19 disinformation, you will be surprised that what on earth people are thinking. Why, why, why on earth these kind of claims have been put forward? Uh, it sometimes goes beyond the understanding. Perfect. Thank you very much uh, for answering also this question. I think we don't have any other question in the chat uh, at the moment. Um, I remind the participant one more time to, to save the link uh, for the feedback form because we would like to hear also from you. Uh, yes, it was a very useful uh, webinar. Indeed, uh, I agree. Thank you very much. Uh, but there is one uh, more question from, from Sarah. So let's take this opportunity. Students are great uh, social media, I think, user. Which strategies can you suggest to encourage, uh, which strategy can you suggest to encourage their access to quality press? Often it's not free and good quality information. So um, nobody wants to spread. Uh, I've been doing a lot of exercises with young people um, in the past years, and actually nobody wants to spread uh, false information and disinformation on purpose. And if they are aware that uh, something they share is uh, not correct, it's kind of shameful thing. Um, there are a lot of free uh, sources which are reliable. It is true that uh, some magazines and some quality journals are behind the pay, pay, um, paywall, but there are a lot of research, a lot of information available for free. And uh, to find these kind of free sources, uh, reliable sources, is the important thing. Also, to find the experts one can count on. Um, uh, it's not sometimes easy to find out them, but uh, for example, in Finland, we are kind of listing the reliable statistics, reliable um, platforms. Uh, and uh, in each country has a different type of structures, so it's difficult to generalize it. But um, there are 
um, reliable information available without uh, having to pay. But unfortunately, yes, very many quality press um, are behind the paywall. We have another comment. Thank you for the excellent presentation. How can each one start using gold mentioning tool to know if an information is reliable? Um, <laughs> this is a, a question where I would recommend to go through to the fact checking point of this presentation. Um, one has to take claim by claim, um, look the author, look the sources and the evidence and then uh, kind of decide if this is trustworthy or not. Um, and in the end, um, a lot of this information is quite easy to kind of reveal, but not all. It's difficult, but worth doing. And once you get this mindset of not sharing everything you, you will see, not getting, not believing everything you, you get in your screen, having this little bit um, two seconds before you are clicking something that is this true? Is this coming from reliable source? Can I find the author? Is there a, a evidence? Yeah, these kind of questions you ask, you will be saved for a lot of harm. Thank you, thank you very much. Um... Well, we have a comment that it's fair because good journalists need to be paid, but for teenagers it's difficult to access because it's not always easy to recognize without the help of adults. Yeah, that's it's very true. true. Yeah. yeah. I'm just waiting because they are typing. I see them typing, so I don't want to close it in case we have any other questions. No, I'm not in a hurry. <laughs> no, exactly. No, just, I think just a lot of thank you. Okay. Thank you. And tomorrow with this expert group, we are starting to tackle Europe-wise uh, the disinformation. And it's going to be uh, in, uh, very interesting. This is an area where we are learning uh, new things every day. Like I said, the media scene is moving, developing very fast. And um, it's it's quite a, quite important that this kind of expert group have been created so we can start informing the teachers in Europe about what to do and also to advise uh, the educational um, authorities on how to develop the national curricula in order to take account these uh, things because the schools are the place where naturally students could learn critical thinking um, online reasoning online behavior uh, and to find correct information, to analyze it and, and find it. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, everything was really interesting and uh, thank you for all the resources uh, and the tools you provided. Um, I would like to remind you last time the feedback form, please uh, uh, remember to save the link before we close uh, the webinar and that no certificates are issued for issued for this session. So uh, once again, thank you very much, Kari. Thank you very much, Eleonora, for the support uh, in the in the background. And I wish you all a really uh, good evening. Let's keep in touch. I'm sure we will have other opportunity to meet Kari. Thank you very much, Kari, and thank you to all the participants for being here today. Bye-bye.